it is 5.35, um, so I will continue to let people in as they join, but we're going to get started. Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, Zoo Idaho Science Talk Series. Um, my name is Rachel Schraus, I'm the Education Curator, and today I'm very excited um, to present to you guys Chief Barnesworth, and he is going to go over fi uh, fire science um, and do some demos for us. Uh, if you guys will keep your uh, microphones muted and videos off during the presentation, we will have time for questions um, at the end to go over anything um, that you might want to know that we missed and um, anything else uh, that you might want to ask. So uh, we'll get started and I will turn it over to Chief Farnsworth here. Let me get you a host here. Oh, so you might have to let people in now. Yeah if you're the host. So there you go. And you can start. Let me start with get my screen pulled up here. Okay, tell me you can see that, Rachel? Yep, you're good to go. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to be here. I think this is uh, great to have, you know, a bunch of these different uh, courses brought up and get some interest in the uh, what people are doing and so thank you for having me Rachel I'm excited um so to kind of introduce myself my name is J.R. Farnsworth I'm the current fire chief for North Bank Fire District um so I actually started up in the fire service in 2010 at Chubby Fire Department um while I was there I gained my ISAC certifications the ISAC's kind of accredit accreditation board um for one part of the one of the, the two for the nation um, but I got my firefighter one, and firefighter two, along with my hazmat driver operator uh, certifications from ISAC. Um, while I was going to, uh, well, while I was at Chubbuck Fire, finished up with those uh, courses, decided to get my bachelor's in fire science. And so uh, I joined Purdue University Global, did the course online. I, I actually enjoyed the online course versus going in person. So I actually enjoyed that. Um, Graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Fire Science, and then I went to uh, continue on to a graduate, got my Master's of Business Administration with a concentration in Human Resources. And I met Rachel at the uh, Polktel Chubbuck Leadership. We're part, both part of the class of 2019, 2021, Go Leadership. And then uh, currently I'm actually one of the members of Purdue Global Public Safety Advisory Board. So basically what the advisory board is, we actually look at what we want taught in at Purdue University Global for the fire science and law enforcement programs. And then I'm also a volunteer for the National Fire Heritage Center, um, where I'm a writer and contributor for some of the biographies. Um, just recently, I've written an article on Harvey Eisner, and then I wrote one previously on Brunatini. So uh, kind of interesting to see the the greats of the fire service. So that's been uh, quite a joy of mine. So that's a little bit about me. Change screens here. So some of the objectives I want to talk about today is I want to be able to define fire science, identify the careers that use fire science. Uh, we'll talk about some of the measurements that we use and some of the research completed by UL and NIST. Uh, we're going to identify some changes in the fire service that have come out of the fire science research. And for the finale, we're going to light a dollhouse on fire. I think that's the coolest part, right? That's what everybody's waiting for. So what is fire science? So put simply, it is the study of fire. But the question then becomes, what is fire? Is something on fire only when we can see flames? Marion Webster defined fire as an exothermic chemical reaction that emits heat and light. Um, the NFPA, also known as National Fire Protection Association, defines it as a rapid oxidation process, which is a chemical reaction resulting in the evolution of light and heat in varying intensities. That's kind of really the legal definition of what fire is. For firefighters, 
Hold on. Let's see. Looks like we got a couple people we gotta admit. There we go. Um, so basically for firefighters, this is known as the fire tetrahedron. For fire to exist, there must be sufficient oxygen, heat, fuel, and a sustaining chemical reaction. If we, if we remove one of the elements, the fire goes out. If we add an element, the fire will grow. Closing all the doors and windows to a room, the fire will eventually run out of oxygen and the fire will go out. You can demonstrate this idea just by placing a glass cup over a candle and the fire goes out. Water is used to absorb the heat from the fire. Um, it will make, take more water, of course, to put out a fire that's extremely large versus a small fire where there's just a small amount of water that, that needs to be used. Fuel can be used to extinguish a fire. The removal of fuel can be used to extinguish a fire as well. So if you cut the wick off a burning candle, the small piece of the wick will burn for just a little bit until it's all used up all the fuel in that wick and then your candle will stay intact. So on the fire ground, the example is actually taking the couch that is on fire, taking it out of the house and setting it in the front yard. The couch will continue to smolder and burn until we put water on it, but the house remains intact. Um, the last element is the chemical chain reaction. A great example of this is the use of baking soda on a grease fire. Um, Baking soda, when heated by fire, actually becomes sodium carbonate, which water and carbon dioxide is released. So carbon dioxide actually replaces the oxygen as the bonding agent, thus stopping the chain reaction. So a dry campfire extinguisher acts much of the same way. So understanding how these four elements work together provides an opportunity to use fire science in a variety of fields. Just make sure I get everybody logged in here. Okay, um, so understanding of fire science gives the opportunity to become better structural and wildland firefighters. Arson and insurance investigators will use their knowledge of fire science to optimistically determine the point of origin and the cause of fire. Fire science is also used in fire prevention to create regulations and codes and products to prevent fires from starting in the first place. Researchers may use fire science to find more efficient ways to extinguish fires determine what actions are taken that makes the incident better or worse, or provide feedback regarding materials used during construction to determine survivability for a person around those materials. So these are the, the four areas that mainly we see uh, fire science being applied. So three top priorities for firefighters are to save lives, prevent property loss, and protect the environment. Every action taken by a firefighter will make the fire better or worse. In this video, upon arrival, the video appear, the fire appears to be in the basement room where the window has fell. The furniture and fixtures in the room are providing fuel for the fire. The broken window appears to provide enough oxygen for the fire. There is ample heat resulting from the chemical chain reaction combustion to continue building the fire. The fire could be put out with the removal of oxygen, which would require refilling that window and ensuring that all the doors are closed. At this point, that would be difficult to accomplish. Um, the heat coming from that room would make it difficult for firefighters to go in and actually remove the fuel out of that room. Um, a large fire extinguisher could eventually put the fire out, but it wouldn't be very efficient. So the most efficient would, would be to absorb the heat through the application of water through the window. Fire departments want to cool the environment quickly and vent out the hot gases to prevent other areas from becoming involved. Done properly, the fire goes out quickly and further damage is prevented. So let's watch this video and see if the actions of this firefighter makes things better or worse. So you can see right there on the bottom, it's contained to that one room.
the left had the firefighter falling down either. So I think we all would say that uh, this firefighter bay things works, right? Um, had the firefighter understood that adding more air to the fire that is already well developed would only make things worse, I hope he would have made a better decision. In this situation, three firefighters were actually upstairs doing a search for victims when the other firefighter broke those windows. The three interior firefighters had to rush out of the building to prevent from being injured or killed. The study of fire science helps firefighters understand the why of the actions they take on the fire ground. We can also use the knowledge to determine if it is safe for firefighters to make entry into a building and where in the building victims may be at and be safe until they can be rescued. Fire science can be used by supervisors to, de to determine how dangerous a building may be based on the fuels and chemicals stored or used in that building. Another interesting field that incorporates fire science is that of a fire investigator. Fire investigators are tasked with understanding how a fire started. Fires can be started on purpose, such as in the case of arson or on accident, such as the dryer vent catching on fire. Did I add two more people. These investigators will look for clues such as the charring of wood, the smell of an accelerant, or the arcing of a wire. Typically, a fire investigator will start working from the outside to the inside. Each element of the fire tetrahedron brings them closer and closer to where the fire started. In Colorado, an apartment building that was under construction caught fire. This news story speaks to a retired fire investigator to share some of the work done by investigators. It's like an archaeological excavation. You you pattern or you uh, uh, layer search through that area, and you save all that debris. Ashes and dust will be sorted through. Electrical wire and outlets will have to be examined for arcing. We go from the areas of least damage to the areas of most damage. Investigators hope to narrow the origin to a room, then a section of the room, and eventually a very specific place. In Douglas County, Jace Larson, Denver 7. Right now on the DenverChannel.com, you're going to find more information. Investigators have a long road ahead, and they could be dealing with evidence. You would need a microscope to see. And Denver 7 investigative reporter Jace Larson spent the day with that fire experts to see what investigators do to narrow down the search. So see how we get it twisting now? At this private fire lab in Douglas County, they have high-tech and low-tech ways of investigating. We'll um, show you a fire pattern against this piece of cardboard. Most fire investigations work the same way. An example of a, of a plume, a fire plume pattern. They search for clues, not how a fire started at first, but where. You can easily see the pattern that the flames left, showing which direction they moved. Now imagine all of this on a much larger scale, like a wall. Investigators also will determine if a fire moved across a floor first, like when we hold this horizontally. It's burning and it'll continue to burn, but at a pretty slow rate. But watch how the fire behaves when it's going up a wall. So the fire was spread much quickly. Even though so much burned yesterday at the apartment's construction site, former fire investigator and now Metropolitan State University of Denver professor Kevin Hammonds says that fire patterns will still be there. It's like an archeological excavation. You, you pattern or you uh, uh, layer search through that area and you save all that debris. Ashes and dust will be sorted through. Electrical wire and outlets will have to be examined for arcing. You go from the areas of least damage to the areas of most damage. Investigators hope to narrow the origin to a room, then a section of the room and eventually a very specific place. In Douglas County, Jace Larson, Denver 7. So as I said in the video, Fire investigators can identify where a fire started by how it progressed. And Lay down. So we got somebody that's not muted. If you'll all check your mics, make sure you're muted. Yeah. 
Anyway, this story, news story speaks to a retired fire investigator. He shares some of the work done by investigators. They also understand how accelerants such as gasoline and natural gas will affect the fire's growth. They will also understand how the fire may have started in one room, but another room had more damage because of the highly flammable furnishings in that room. Right now on the DenverChannel.com, you're going to find. So let's talk a little bit about fire prevention. Uh, fire prevention will also will use the elements of fire science. The best way to put out a fire is not to have one in the first place. Knowing how different material will act under fire can help in the designs of buildings, building construction, product design, and even fire extinguishment devices. Let me let me state here: I am not a sales rep for any products discussed or shown, and I have no gain by sharing these products. I'm simply showing how an understanding of fire science can be used in fire prevention. In this video here, we see how a special blanket can be used to suffocate an electric vehicle fire. So we can see uh, this blanket must be breathable and it, or non-breathable and able to withstand the high temperatures associated with vehicle fire. With the move to more electric powered vehicles, firefighters are looking for new ways to put the fire out without using water, since water and electricity is not a good combination. The film shows how Peru's persistence helped the Pope do a 180 on the sex abuse scandal in Chile, going from denial to an. There is a ball that has been invented that will explode dry chemical powder when thrown in a the fire then extinguishes the fire. They sell several different sizes of these balls for kitchens, vehicles, and bedrooms. Computer rooms must stay clean yet with the electronics there is a high risk of fire. Different chemical gases can be used to either remove the oxygen or stop the chemical reaction from occurring. The future of fire prevention and firefighting is based on research and ingenuity. So we'll actually go on to actually talking with uh, some of the measurements we use. So as with most scientific fields, data that is quantitative is preferred, which often results in a high understanding of mathematics. We want to share some of the terms that are used in fire science and their meaning. BTUs is an acronym for British Thermal Units. One BTU refers to the amount of heat energy that's required to increase the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit at the temperature that water has its greatest density, which is approximately 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat flux is the rate of heat energy transfer per surface unit area measured as kilowatt per square meter. So on a sunny day, the heat flux is basically one kilowatt per, sun, per square meter. So a heat flux of three to five kilowatt per square meters will actually cause pain to the skin within seconds. So there's not much variance there. Heat release rate 
is the rate at which fire releases energy and measured in units of, of watts or joules. One joule per second is a watt. A kilowatt, therefore, is a thousand joules per second, or also referred to as a kilojoule. Temperature and heat release rates are different. One candle has an approximate heat release rate of 80 watts at a temperature of approximately 930 degrees Fahrenheit. If you place two candles together, the flame temperature stays the same, but the heat release rate doubles to 160 watts. If you place 10 candles together, again, the flame temperature still stays the same, but the heat release rate is now 800 watts. So it's the heat release rate that increases. For comparison, a twin size mattress on fire had a heat release rate of 3,800 kilowatts. A two-seat sofa gave off 3,360 kilowatts. And Christmas trees range from 3,200 to 4,300 kilowatts. So you can imagine just the heat that those things give off. Um, we need to discuss the fire growth stages. There's the incipient stage, which is when the fire is just starting out. You have the growth stage where fire spreads to other fuels. Flashover, which is not a stage, but it's a condition where there is a rapid transition between growth and fully developed stages where everything in the room combusts simultaneously. And then the fully developed stage is where the fire has all the components of the fire tetrahedron and can free burn. And then you have the decay stage, which occurs as the fuel is absorbed. So over the years, there have been many changes in our home and office furnishings. So we're gonna watch this video between what we call legacy furniture, which is mostly made of cottons and natural materials, to the modern furnishings made of synthetics, plastics, and foam. So they started both these fires at the same time. Also look at the smoke difference between the legacy fuels versus the smoke coming off the synthetics and the modern, modern furnishings. So within four minutes, 50 seconds, we're at that whole room being fully involved. Meanwhile, in our old legacy homes, they're still just barely burning. So uh, over 30 minutes for that legacy room to actually reach flashover stage compared to five minutes. Um, that legacy sofa made of cotton wood has a peak heat release rate of 370 kilowatts at a little over 15 minutes. The modern sofa with 
polyolefin fabric and other plastics has a peak release rate of 1,990 kilowatts at four and a half minutes. So you can see the heat comparison difference as well. While the average home size has increased 56% since the 1970s, the fire service resources available, available to respond have not increased proportionally in many areas in the United States. Newer homes tend to incorporate features such as taller ceilings, open floor plans, two-story foyers, and great rooms. All these features remove com compartmentation, add volume, and can contribute to rapid smoke and fire spread. Larger homes have more air available to grow and sustain fires. As homes become more energy efficient and fuel loads increases, fires will become ventilation limited, making the introduction of air during a house fire extremely dangerous. If ventilation is increased through a tactical action of firefighters or through unplanned events such as window failure or a neighbor opening the door, heat release will increase and potentially result in flash over conditions. Modern fires convert from room and content fire to structure fires quickly due to the failure of modern building components. Modern construction materials are lighter weight than traditional materials and have a shorter time to structural collapse. The engineered wood eye joists collapse in six minutes and the unprotected two by 10 lumber legacy floor system collapsed in 18 and a half minutes. So they're collapsing three times as fast. The big takeaway from all these changes is that there are shorter escape times for residents and that early notification by a smoke alarm is critical to surviving the house fire. So several organizations coordinated. Have, take, have taken firefighting and fire science to the next level to validate strategy and tactics used in the fire service. United Laboratories, also known as UL, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, known as NIST, and the Illinois Fire Service Institute have been leaders in completing large-scale research affecting the fire service. Some of these projects include fire behavior research, which focuses on how fire behaves in different conditions, coordinated fire attack, which analyzes what happens when water is placed on the fire, and then ventilation of the structure immediately follows. Flow path door control, which examines what happens when homeowners or firefighters open doors and windows to make entry. Host stream comparisons, which looks at the effect of using a fog or cone-shaped water stream versus a straight or smooth bore stream. And the effect of vent inner search, which is used in rooms where there's still a possibility of life. Here's a preview of the coordinated fire attack by UL, NIST, and IFSI. Fire attack study builds on all of UL FSRI's previous research. This study focuses primarily on the sequencing of ventilation and suppression operations on the fire ground to improve victim survivability and firefighter safety. We're taking the experience from the streets and mixing it with science and true data to save civilian lives more so in the future than we ever have in the past. We're taking the research out of the laboratory, out into the field, working with the fire service to burn acquired structures to get that additional realism. And thanks to the assistance of THS, FEMA, and UL, we've been able to take the laboratory to the street. We've brought our trailer and all our instrumentation out to the field. For the first time, we're getting across that of environment. The single family dwelling, the multi family dwelling, and then the commercial setting. And this is a wheelhouse with real furnishings. It's going to rain today. And you can't get any more real than what's going on here. The structures here are real structures. About 90 days ago is when people got, got moved out of here. Without the data, this becomes just a demonstration. Adding that level of instrumentation and data really allows us to quantify the fire ground versus just watching the fire ground. Using our instrumentation, we can look at things such as heat flux, pressure, and temperature combined together with instrumentation from the Illinois Fire Service Institute, this whole complement of instrumentation allows us to look holistically at the benefits of coordinating our suppression tactics with ventilation. Using thick skin, we're assessing risk for skin burns. We have another laser-based system that is focused on moisture measures. We have a new system to quantify time-resolved measurements of hydrogen cyanide, which really complements the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen sensors that you will very important for us to have fire service partners. Ultimately, without their partnership, we aren't able to get these structures. We can't do it on our own. I'm hoping that the way we are doing our tactics now can change.
change to help save more lives because this is what it's all about. It's about saving firefighters, saving the occupants inside. So they're doing a lot of cool things, uh, those agencies. I think it'd be cool to have a job like that. Um, so because of continued research in fire science, new fire protection standards are being created to protect firefighters and people. Fire departments are reviewing their old ways and new ways of firefighting. Firefighters are more aware of how flow paths can be dangerous and that proper ventilation must occur at the correct time. Firefighters have also learned when cooling is more important than the fear of pushing fire using the hose strings. There is so much that can be done to improve fire safety in our community as new research is being done. Firefighter structural gear is becoming more lightweight, reducing the heat stress. New fire shelters are being designed for wildland firefighters to protect them from being overran by flames. We look forward to what the future holds as we progress. So at this time, we're going to demonstrate the burning, burning of a Palmer's dollhouse. The Palmer dollhouse was designed to be able to show firefighters different flow paths, ventilation impacts, and how a backdraft or smoke explosion occurs. So give me just a moment, switch to my other device, and we'll take a good look at the dollhouse. Sorry for the feedback. Sir. Hold that for just a moment. All right, so this is the Palmer dollhouse and we'll try to show it to you here. So basically this dollhouse has four compartments on it. We have this upper room, which there is no openings. So that would be like a closed bedroom door. This would be like an upstairs. There's a door opening from the basement. So like a stairway. We have this room here that has a door between this first room and this other room. And uh, so we can actually get fire to go between those two. This is gonna be our fire room. We've got a couple of some uh, wood in there and some fuel to get this fire started. So we're gonna stand back and let these firefighters kind of do this, so. So of course our firefighters in good structural gear. Um, we just want to make sure there he's protected. Of course, weather can actually impact the way fire behaves as well. Um, when we have lower humidity, um, fires burn quite better. Um, we get uh, some wind, wind will definitely help. Today is kind of rainy and snowy and cold.
a little bit of a flame starting to go. So as we kind of walk around this, you can see there's some light wisping smoke coming out from maybe some of the back corners. We got somewhat of fire going now. So this would basically be the incipient stage of a fire. It's just barely starting to go. Still looking for oxygen to breathe. One of the things we're looking at is if you look, there's the smoke's coming out of the top half and the bottom half is clear. And that's what we call the neutral plane. And so it's bringing air in from the bottom and coming out the top. We call that bi-directional flow. One of the things we also look at is the speed of the smoke. Um, the hotter that fire gets, the quicker the smoke's gonna actually start pouring out of there. So we got a halfway good fire going right now. So if uh, Chief Powell would actually close that door, we're gonna take away the oxygen from that fire. Go ahead and open her back up. You can see it actually diminished the fire. If we were to close that all the way, he would actually put that fire all the way out. So it would basically run out of oxygen. But because we don't want to try to light it twice, we're going to let it go ahead and continue burning. Build up a little bit more heat in there. So this would basically be like, say your living room was on fire. In room two, you've got your door Right now, the door is closed to that room too. So let's go ahead and open up room two real quick. So we've got quite a bit of smoke in there, but no fire. So we're gonna go ahead, there's a doorway. We're gonna open up between that. We'll hopefully get a, what they call the Venturi effect. And we'll be able to see the fire move between the two rooms. So if you look right now, there's no uh, smoke coming out of room one. It's everything in there is actually an intake for the air and it's pushing the smoke out of room two. Let's go and open up room four right there. So this is above the fire floor. We still don't have any fire going on there. It's still, it, we got a little bit of smoke, but not bad. If 
by this time you should have all your smoke alarms going in your house going off. I'm gonna add a little bit more fuel to that fire. Go ahead and close room four up. We're gonna see if we can't get that fire to come over to this other side to room two. Ready? We're starting to get some fire over here into this other room here. And firefighters can actually build these doll houses with different features. Um, the tighter they seal them up, uh, the more uh, we can actually get them to have different uh, properties. Like I said, most of our homes anymore, they're built really tight and really sealed. So they, there's not a lot of oxygen exchange. Okay, let's go ahead and open up the floor on room three. So right now there's a doorway that's keeping the fire from the bottom to the top. So we're going to remove that doorway. Again, you can see there's hardly any smoke coming out of that bottom, that bottom floor. It's all pushing out the top. You can see still on the back, we got a little bit of white smoke. So one of the things that you'll see a fire chief or uh, the first arriving officer do is actually what they call a 360. So they're going to walk around the structure and they're trying, going to try to look at the smoke and the density to determine where that fire is at.
Sometimes getting these fires to actually uh, rock and roll sometimes takes a bit. But you can see, you know, that's again, there's no smoke coming out of that first floor where the fire is actually at. It's all pushed out the second floor. So one of the things firefighters will look for is to see which rooms actually have um, openings, which door, windows are open, which doors are open. Knowing that the fire is on that first floor and I see smoke coming out that second, I actually know there's a pathway for the air to flow from the fire room all the way up. Yeah, so the, you see that kind of that smoke's really kind of pushing out that that uh, second story window there. And that bedroom that's all enclosed, it's got some smoke, but we still don't have any fire up there. That's why it's so important to make sure that you sleep with that door, your bedroom door closed. It provides a, a survivable space for you. We're finally about reaching flashover in that uh, first floor room. And the fire lapping over, that's actually one way that fire sometimes actually uh, goes from a bottom floor to the top floor. It's not actually through the house, but actually through the, uh, through overlapping windows. You can just see that smoke just push out of that other room. And if you look at that flame, it's sucking air in as quickly as, it, as possible in there. So right now it's going into ventilation limited smoke. How's our second room? Are we got fire in there yet? Yep, you can see the smoke actually suck in on that, that room as well. So it's still looking for air. Notice the foul, he, as he opens that uh, door, that flame will actually start releasing out the other out the vent. We're going to see if we can't get this uh, thing into back, what they call a back wrap, which means we've got to make sure it's really hot and ventilation limited. And then we're going to give it a whole bunch of air all at once. If you watch that smoke, it starts actually puffing where it's just a little puff every now and then. And if you see it, remember on the video, it showed about three and a half, four minutes, the one room being fully involved and then flashover stage. Um, 
that's just barely when the fire department is getting out the front door. And so it may be a couple minutes more before they show up, which could actually put it in a uh, back, be ready for a backdrop because it's using up all the heat and uh, be ventilation limited. Are we can get there, Glenn, you think? So that good fire going there. Yeah, I think in this cold weather, we're, it's just getting very difficult to actually get it hot enough to do that. But anyway, at this time, basically the fire department is going to show up. They're going to uh, be ready to actually uh, make entry and they also want to do some ventilation as well. So the first thing they're going to do is actually cut a hole in the top of the roof. And so that would basically be the hole they cut, but they do not want to make the hole between the ceiling and the fire until the extinguishment's ready. But we're going to go ahead and open up that, uh, the ceiling. And you can see by doing that, we have now lifted most of the smoke All the smoke is actually going all out the, out the ceiling. There we go. So you see, we now have the fire coming up. Close this one up. Now it's basically acting as a chimney for that fire. So that's that's the demonstration for our Palmer dollhouse. We're gonna go ahead and end it there. Um, there's your backdraft. Got it hot enough. Should we try it one more time? And this is why our guys wear uh, protective gear. <laughs> She's hot enough. So basically a rapid introduction of air and it basically explodes on it. So there's your backdrop. All right. I'll let those guys put the fire out. We try to make you. I'm just going to come out here. All right, let's see if I can make you whole somehow here, Rachel. Yeah, for a second. Rachel. All right, Rachel, you should have it. Uh, 
All right. That was pretty awesome. I learned that I do some really terrible things in my own home by not shutting doors and buying synthetic furniture. Um, but we are going to open it up. If you have any questions, you should be able to send them to me through the chat and I can relay those um, to JR. So if anyone who joined today has anything they'd like to ask, um, now would be a great time. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right, and we got one. Okay, I don't have any questions yet from anybody. Yeah, it's so important. You know, the main thing is like I said, closing those doors is so important for your own safety and your children's safety. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, so, well, thank you for showing us the demonstration. Um, I really enjoy learning how fire works and it's important in our area, both with our own safety with our homes and also with all the brush fires and wildfires that we're seeing around the area. And I really appreciate you, you taking the time to educate us um, about that. Oh, we got one question coming in. Go ahead. Just type it in there, Mark. Hold on one second here. Oh, All can right. you hear me? We can hear you. Nice. Okay. So my question is, um, if so, we've got some fire alarms, but uh, you have to buy a certain type in order to have those fire alarms alert the the station. Yeah, um, unless you actually have a monitoring service, um, you know, like one of the paid monitoring services, um, those were the only ones that would actually dispatch a fire department to your home. Um, the other ones would basically just alert yourself um, and, your, and your family. But yeah, if you want them to be dispatched, they have to be a monitored uh, fire uh, suppression or fire alarm system. Okay. Um, my next question is, do you know of any kind of, um, uh, what's the word, like subsidy or anything for, so I can throw out all my modern furniture and, and buy some wood and, and cotton stuff? Yeah, not that I'm aware of, you know. That's a bummer. It, it's, it's just the nature of, you know, it's less expensive to actually use the synthetic than the you know, the plastics to build stuff any more than it is to use the wood, especially with the price of lumber right now. Um, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything that lets people kind of build back to that legacy. But it's something just to keep in mind is, you know, how close are you putting that furniture to each other and, you know, make sure, you know, the room's got a little bit more space between stuff just to keep the fire, da fire load down. I'm surprised that uh, insurance companies don't do something like that it seems like it, it might save them money you know right yeah and you know one of the greatest things to do is actually have a sprinkler system in your home um residential sprinkler systems depending on who you talk to um they're really not that expensive for the savings that they'll give you both on your insurance and uh just in the state of mind to know that you know that sprinkler system will at least keep the fire in check a lot better than uh, just not having one. Um, how, what's the uh, most common cause of a house fire? Uh, kitchen fires are typically, or cooking fires is one of the main causes of house fires. Of course, uh, smoking, 
Um, it's kind of gone down a little bit because you know they've kind of modified the cigarettes now where you actually have to be puffing on them for them to continue to burn. They actually will burn themselves out. But uh, kitchen and cooking fires seem to be the biggest for uh, house fires. Okay. That's kind of what I assume. I also have a question in the chat. It says, um, JR, what are your top three to five home fire safety tips? Um, first, make sure you have working smoke alarms. Test those smoke alarms monthly. Make sure you change the batteries. Most of your smoke alarms now are 10 year batteries, so you don't really have to change those as long as it's got the 10 year battery in it. But checking those things monthly is so critical. I've been on several house fires where they've actually had smoke alarms in the house, but they did not go off because the batteries were dead. So that's kind of scary to think that, you know, that could cause somebody not to wake up. Um, practice your escape plans. We, we talk about it to kids all the time and, you know, we sometimes get them to draw it, but nobody ever practices them. And when you only have two and a half to three minutes to get out of your house, they need to be practiced and not just your normal way out. They need to practice going through the windows. Um, make sure you have fire extinguishers in your home, um, especially located in the kitchen. Um, that, like I said, there are other devices out there that you can actually hang up over your uh, kitchen or over your stove um, and over your fireplace. So if the fire does get out, you know, those will put those out. So, but, those are the three mains. Make sure you know your ways out. Sleep with the door closed. Um, provide that safety space and practice your, your drills. Those are so important. Awesome. Well, oh, we got another one. Okay. What's the best way to escape out of a basement during a fire? Um, Kind of depends. Hopefully, you know, the newer codes require an egress out of the basement, a window that can actually get a person out. Uh, back in the day, those windows used to be very small where it'd be difficult to get out. Um, you have to kind of know where that fire is at. And if the fire is in the basement, um, definitely out, go out the window. Um, if the fire is above you, if there's a side door, that's the best way to just get up and out that side door. Just use your closest exit. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? All right. I don't see any coming in, JR. Um, Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Thank you. Uh, and we might have to have you come back and uh, do some fire teaching for our summer camps or something when we teach fire ecology. Um, this is our last science talk of the month. Um, if you are interested in programming on Thursday evenings in April, we'll be doing an in-person climate science series. Um, and you can find the information on our website. Thank you guys all for coming out and joining us this evening. And once again, thank you, JR, for a great presentation. It was wonderful. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Everybody have a great evening.